Welcome to lecture four. We're going to take a short break from looking at industry now and discuss a topic that our friend the ghost of chemical engineering past has brought up. And that is the topic of dimensional analysis. We saw last lecture how dimensional analysis can be used to help to design models, to scale up processes, to design experiments and to gain insight into physical processes. And so it's quite important that we understand how to use this technique within a chemical engineering context. I know that you will have all come across dimensional analysis before, but I doubt whether you've used it in the same way that a chemical engineer does. So, for this lecture and for next lecture, we're going to revise a bit about dimensional analysis and we're going to introduce to you how chemical engineers use it. So, the location I've chosen to talk about this, I think, would be one that the Ghost of Chemenge Pass would be quite pleased with. It's an old steam pump out in the middle of North Norfolk, and this should provide a good, relaxed setting to discuss. So, we're going to start by thinking about some revision, and we'll revisit the concepts of consistency and homogeneity. So, consistency. Let's think about the fundamental fact that any unit of measurement can be reduced to what we term fundamental units. These fundamental units are international standards and there are seven in total, six of which are listed on the board here. We'll be mostly dealing with mass, length, time and temperature within chemical engineering. We will also be dealing with a unit that is not on this board, which is quantity of material, moles. And so those five out of the seven are typical chemical engineering fundamental units. We should also look at electric current and luminous intensity. For those of you who specialise in electrochemistry, electric current, of course, will also be a very important fundamental unit to use. So let's see how we use these fundamental units and how we relate them to units of measurement. So let's start with a simple example. Let's think about pressure. The SI unit of pressure is Pascal. And if we think about what pressure is physically telling us, it is effectively a force on a given area. So if we divide force by area, we should get the measurement unit. And so we know force is newtons and area is square meters. So a Pascal is a newton per square meter. However, in terms of fundamental units, we can think of a force as a mass times an acceleration. And so there on the whiteboard, I've put mass as kilos, acceleration as meter per second squared in the numerator. And we're dividing that all by area, which of course is meters squared, which gives us our fundamental units for pressure, which is mass divided by length divided by time squared. And so we can reduce any SI unit, or any CGS unit for that matter, into the fundamental units that we need for dimensional analysis. Now, Second rule, homogeneity. Additive terms must have the same dimension. So if we think about pressure once more, here on the whiteboard I've put an equation that involves pressure. It's Bernoulli's equation. You will be familiar from, with this from your fluid mechanics. We've already seen that pressure takes fundamental units of math, mass divided by length divided by time squared. Therefore, anything we add to it has to have those same fundamental units. So a half rho u squared is mass over length over time squared. Rho gh has the same units. Also, anything that appears on the right-hand side and the left-hand side of an equal sign has to have the same fundamental units. And so w here is a mass flow rate, kilos per second, mass per unit time. The right-hand side is density rho times area A times velocity U, and that also has to have those same dimensions, mass divided by time. So, this gives us some checks we can do. If we can see that every single unit that we add together has the same dimensions, then it's liable that there isn't a mistake in the equation. If we look on the left-hand side of an equal sign and the right-hand side of an equal sign, again, if the fundamental units are the same on both sides, then chances are the equation hasn't got an error in it. If the dimensions are different, we know for sure that the equation is incorrect. And you will be surprised how often, when you look at the literature, you will find fundamental unit mismatch. It's because 
people are human and humans make errors. Even when they write papers, even when things appear reviewed, always check that equations are correct. Now, we can also use dimensional analysis to help us out of it. You will find as you progress through the discipline of chemical engineering that lots of parameters sort of sound the same. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example in terms of aeroplanes. Here is a picture of Vulcan, the XXXH558, Spirit of Britain. And when we think about jet aircraft, we often think about, well, how fast do they go? And the speed of a jet aircraft is often represented by a non-dimensional group, the Mach number. Now, the Mach number is the speed of an object divided by the local speed of sound. So U here is the speed of my object, my speed of my aircraft. In the denominator, I have the square root of gamma RT, which gives us a calculation for the speed of sound. Gamma is a ratio of heat capacities, Cp over Cv. R is a gas constant, and T is the absolute temperature. So the square root of gamma RT gives us the local speed of sound for a given gas, governed by gamma and R, and T, a given temperature. So let's see what numbers we have to put into that equation at root gamma RT to get us a speed of sound. So let's think of our gas constant, R, 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin. And let's look at all the other parameters. Gamma is the quotient of two heat capacities. So gamma is dimensionless. T is in Kelvin. U is in meters per second. Where on the right-hand side of that equation can you see anything else involving moles? Because moles have to cancel out because M, the Mach number, is dimensionless. The answer is, of course, that aren't any other quantities involving moles. And so this is the wrong R to use. There is another gas constant. It is a specific gas constant. It's specific to a material. It's R divided by relative molecular mass. And so what we should be using here is the specific gas constant for air. And I've written this R hat to delineate it from R. And R hat is 287 joules per kilo per Kelvin. And if you look at those units, joules per kilo per Kelvin, and the other dimensions that we have within the expression U over root gamma RT, we will see that all the units cancel. And so the dimensional analysis here has allowed us not to make a mistake by using the wrong physical constant. Now, Often in a problem, we need to find dimensionless groups, and we'll be talking about finding dimensionless groups at length. One way I want you to remember how to define dimensionless groups is to get an equation and divide it by itself, in effect. So here I've got p plus a half row u squared plus rho gh. I have chosen to divide all terms in this equation by rho u squared, leading to p over rho u squared plus a half, plus gh over u squared. Now, that second equation there next to the smiley face is non-dimensional. And so if we're struggling to find a group, for example, which includes pressure, remember Bernoulli. Remember dividing pressure by another term in Bernoulli, in this case rho u squared, and you suddenly have a whole set of dimensionless groups for a given problem. So it's a very useful technique and saves a lot of time. Now, as a chemical engineer, you will come across lots of different dimensionless groups. The thing I want you to remember is all chemical engineering dimensionless groups have a meaning. And what I would like you to do right from the start is to associate that meaning to the dimensionless group because it gives you an idea of what physical forces are at play in any given problem. So, for example, a Froude number. You'll come across a Froude number. It's U over root GH. It is the ratio of the kinetic energy to potential energy for a given system. If we think about that expression u over root gh, if we square it, we have u squared over gh. And if we multiply denominator and numerator by density, we have rho u squared over rho gh. Now you can see the rho u squared is your kinetic energy, your rho gh is your potential energy. And so u over root gh is an abbreviated form of that that is dimensionless, that gives you an idea where the kinetic energy dominates, 
or potential energy dominates. A very, very useful physical insight. In your fluid mechanics course, you will have already come across the Reynolds number. It's the ratio of inertial stress to viscous stress. When inertial stress is greater than viscous stress, you have turbulent flow. When viscous stress is greater than inertial stress, you have laminar flow. And again, we can get a physical picture of what's actually going on in a given scenario. When you study heat transfer, which you will do next term, you will see something called the Nusselt number. This is the ratio of convective heat transfer to conductive heat transfer. It's written HD over K. H here is a heat transfer coefficient. You'll learn more about that later on in your course. D is a length scale. K is a thermal conductivity. So does convection dominate a problem? Or does conduction dominate a problem? And knowing where the convection or conduction dominates allows you to build a mental model of what's actually going on in a given physical process. You will also come across the Prandtl number, mu Cp over K, viscosity times heat capacity divided by thermal conductivity. This is the ratio of momentum diffusivity to thermal diffusivity, which is a very useful group, again, in heat transfer and fluid mechanics. Now, on page 35 of your data book, you will find somewhere near 20 or 30 dimensionless groups listed. Please become familiar with this page in your data book. Every day, look at it, learn what another dimensionless group actually physically means. This will help you to develop mental models quickly and easily. Now, let's recap a few key points. Any parameter can be reduced to fundamental dimensions, mass, length, time, temperature, quantity of material. If we're adding terms together, all those terms must be dimensionally consistent. If you look at an equation, what appears on the left-hand side of an equal sign has to have the same dimensions as what's on the right-hand side of an equal sign. And we've seen an example of where we can use that concept to check whether an equation is correct or not, or whether we're using the right values of parameters in an equation. Please don't forget, in chemical engineering, dimensionless groups have meanings. They give us insight into a problem. Please become familiar with these meanings. In doing so, please become familiar with page 35 of your data book. It will help you massively when you come to put dimensional analysis into practice.